What is a wild flower? Wild flowers are flowering plants that grow in the wild, in their native habitats. Most of the flowers that people plant in their gardens or keep in their homes are cultivated. Which means they have been grown with the help of people rather than occurring on their own in nature. Over the past several hundred years. Gardeners and scientists have worked to gradually improve the plants that they grow. To improve a plant species, people work to germinate, or grow plants from. Only the seeds that came from the best plants, discarding the seeds of weaker, less attractive plants. Further improvement comes from hybridization, or crossbreeding. In this process, a plant that has beautiful flowers but no scent might be combined with a different plant that has dull flowers but a lovely fragrance. The hope for a result is a plant that combines the best of both plants features, producing pretty flowers that smell nice. This kind of change occurs very slowly, over long periods of time. But the plants that people began with were plants that grew wild. Some plants grew in one part of the world, while others only grew in another part. As people began to travel more, however, they collected plants not native to their homelands, bringing them back to raise at home. Many of the plants that we buy for our gardens today originally came from far away and are the products of the breeding efforts of generations of plant experts. Wild flowers are perfectly suited to their environments. Because they have not been transported from foreign lands. They have also not been changed by plant breeding, and they exist in their original state. Wild flowers grow in many different environments. Like fields, swamps, and forests, and even in your own backyard. Why are leopards spotted? Like the fur of many animals, the leopard's coat is a form of camouflage. Camouflage helps animals blend in with their environments. Making them less visible to predators, the animals that hunt them, and prey, the creatures they hunt. Mostly found in the forests of Africa and Asia, leopards, which hunt in trees and on the ground. Blend in with the dappled sunlight shining through leafy tree branches and other plant life. Melanin is the organic chemical responsible for the pigmentation or color of animal and human skin. The more pigmentation, the darker the color. Black panthers are really leopards that have melanism, a condition of excess pigmentation. If you look closely at a black panther, careful. You may be able to see the same spots that a normal leopard has against a very dark background. Because leopards are mostly nocturnal resting during the day and active. At night this dark coloration causes little problem for black panthers. How can animals live in a desert?
the harsh conditions of desert life present many problems for the animals living there, temperatures get extremely high. Water is scarce, and food supplies, whether in the form of plants or other animals, dwindle. Desert animals have developed numerous techniques, however, to adapt to their unique climate. Just as animals living in cold climates hibernate in winter. So do some desert animals live through dry periods by becoming dormant, or inactive. Desert toads bury themselves deep in the ground. Emerging only after a rainfall to get water and food and to breed. Many desert animals live in underground burrows or in caves, such animals spend hot. Dry days in their dens, away from the sun, coming out in the early morning or at night when it's cooler. Several desert animals are especially equipped to handle hotter temperatures. The large ears of jackrabbits can release heat while they rest in the shade. Owls and some other birds release body heat through their open mouths. Letting their saliva evaporate to cool down their bodies. Many desert residents have pale fur, feathers, scales, or skin. An adaptation that means they absorb less of the sun's heat. They also blend in better with their sandy surroundings, which means they are less visible to predators. The meat eaters in the desert can sometimes get all of the moisture they need from eating their prey. Or, in the case of vultures, from eating carrion, or the flesh of already dead animals. Other desert animals are able to conserve the moisture they do get in amazing ways. The kangaroo rat, for example, can actually create water from the dry seeds it eats. And its kidneys can remove most of the water from its urine, sending the water back through the rat's bloodstream. Thanks to their ability to fly. Birds probably have the easiest time escaping the desert's difficult conditions. They can fly great distances if necessary to find areas where rain has fallen and vegetation is growing. Large winged birds can spend the hottest part of the day soaring way up high where the winds are cooler. Why do whales blow water up into the air? A whale has one or two nostrils or blowholes located far back on the top of its head. A toothed whale has one, a baleen whale has two. Whales can only breathe through their blowholes, which are directly connected to their lungs. Their mouths lead only to the stomach. Blowholes have valves that close when a whale dives. A whale may dive as deep as one mile below the ocean surface and stay underwater for well over an hour. When a whale returns to the surface it spouts, blowing the warm. Moist air that has formed in its lungs out through its blowholes before it takes a fresh breath. The water that has collected on top of the blowholes gets blown into the air along with the whale's breath. Sometimes, the spouting of a large whale can be seen for miles. The type of whale can often be identified by the shape of its spout. What is SAP?
Sap is a term used to describe all the fluids that travel through complex types of plants. Fluids that move through transportation systems made of special xylem and phloem cells. Sap is water with substances like minerals or sugar dissolved in it. Some plants, like maple trees and sugar cane, have so much sugar in their saps that they are raised commercially to make syrup and sugar. Other plants have specialized saps that are hard or sticky, like latex, which is used to make rubber. The sticky gums and resins produced by many trees are thought to protect them from damaging insects and to seal any holes or tears that might occur in their barks. Why are polar bears white? The polar bear lives in the Arctic, the region of the North Pole. Most of its environment is barren, covered year-round with ice and snow and not much else. A polar bear might eat what few plants it can find. But it feeds mostly on water animals like seals and small walruses, which share its frozen home. The polar bear's yellowish-white coat helps it blend into its snowy surroundings as it hunts its prey. After all, there is not much in the Arctic to hide behind. The fur of a polar bear is also extremely thick. Allowing it to withstand polar temperatures and swim in Arctic waters, where its prey is often found. Polar bears are excellent swimmers. And their unique paws with hairy soles allow them to run very quickly over ice and snow without slipping. What plant has the biggest flower? The largest flower in the world has a rather unpleasant name and an equally unpleasant scent. The stinking corpse lily, or Rafflesia arnoldi. This rare and endangered. Flower grows in the jungles of the Southeast Asian islands Borneo and Sumatra. The flowers are orange-brown in color with large white speckles. They can measure 3 feet across and weigh up to 25 pounds, 11 kilograms. Because the stinking corpse lily is a parasite plant which means that it gets its nourishment from other plants it has no stem or leaves. The flower seeds attach themselves to jungle vines and burrow into the vine's tissue. Where they germinate and grow. Eventually a blossom pushes through the vine and grows to huge proportions. Why do some plants die in winter, while others don't? Plants that grow in temperate zones, where there are changes of seasons. Have to be able to go dormant or rest when conditions like short days and cold temperatures become unfavorable for growth. Many trees and shrubs do this by shedding their leaves in the fall. Halting photosynthesis and reducing moisture loss. A great number of flowering plants, known as herbaceous perennials, die down to ground level, sheltering new buds in the ground until spring arrives. Autumn 
with its shorter days and cool nights, begins a survival process in plants called hardening off. Lacking conditions for new growth then, a plant uses its energy to build up more food in its cells. This buildup, in turn, pushes water out into surrounding spaces. Where it will do little damage when it freezes. Plants without this ability to harden their tissues die once freezing temperatures arrive. We call plants that die in winter leaving only their seeds to grow again in spring dash tender plants. Or annuals, because they complete their life cycles within a year. Hardy plants, or perennials, are capable of surviving many winter seasons. Continuing to grow year after year. What are pine cones? The cones found on pines and other conifer plants are reproductive structures. Small male cones produce millions of grains of pollen that are carried by the wind to sticky female cones. Where fertilization takes place and seeds begin to grow. Shortly after they release their pollen, male cones die, their work done. Soft and green at the time of fertilization, female cones gradually become larger, brown, and woody. This change makes room for and protects the growing seeds within its scales. Which unlike those of flowers Dante have hard pod coverings of their own, conifer seeds are described as naked. After a couple of years, when its seeds are mature, a female cone will open and release them into the wind. The female cone may then fall from the plant, its work also done. What is a weed? Strictly speaking, a weed is simply a plant growing where it is not wanted. Weeds usually grow easily and spread, and they often interfere with the growth of more desirable plants. Weeds don't usually have nice features, like pretty flowers or tasty leaves. To make them more appealing to people or other animals. They are frequently hard to get rid of, growing back from the smallest bit left in the ground. People's opinions vary greatly about which plants are weeds. In the United States, for instance. Most people consider dandelions weeds and spend a lot of time and effort trying to get rid of them. In France, however, they are grown as a crop. With their leaves used in salads and their roots processed to make a coffee-like drink. Do camels really store water in their humps? Camels store fat, not water, in the humps on their backs. Living in desert environments, camels use this stored fat for energy if food is not available. The animals can go days without eating. A camel can also go days without drinking because there are pockets in the walls of its stomach that hold water, released bit by bit as the animal needs it. A camel can drink up to 50 gallons, 189 liters, 
of water at one time and store it. There are two types of camels, the Arabian camel or dromedary native to northern Africa which has one hump, and the Bactrian camel native to Central Asia which has two. For centuries, camels have been used by people to cross the desert. Either rid den or used as pack animals carrying supplies. That is why the large, strong beast has often been called the ship of the desert. Able to endure intense heat, camels have many other features that make them well suited to desert surroundings. Their broad, padded hooves do not sink in the sand and there. Long eyelashes and hair-filled nostrils protect their eyes and airways from blowing grit. But their most unique features are their stomachs and humps of fat. At the beginning of a desert journey, when a camel is well fed, its hump can weigh nearly 100 pounds, 45 kilograms. At the end of a long, hard trip, the hump nearly disappears. And all that is left is the loose skin that once covered it kind of like a furry balloon that has lost its air. Why does poison ivy give people rashes? A very irritating oily substance called urushiol is in all parts of a poison ivy plant. As well as in its itchy cousins, poison oak and poison shumac. The plants are found across North America, especially near streams and lakes. The oil itself is harmless, but once it interacts with substances on human skin, it can be interpreted by the body as an unwanted foreign invader. The body's immune system then kicks in and tries to get rid of it. This response is an allergic reaction. About 70% of all people are allergic to the plants and will develop itchy red bumps, blisters, and skin swelling a short time after they come in contact with them. Once the rash occurs, it can spread from one part of the body to another and sometimes lasts many days. Contact with these poisonous plants can happen directly, when a person touches them. Or indirectly, when he or she touches clothes, tools, or animals that have the irritating oil on them. Very sensitive people can even get a rash from the smoke of burning poison ivy, oak, and shumac. The best way to keep from getting an itchy rash is to avoid the plants that cause them. Avoidance is especially hard with poison ivy, which is a creeping. Crawling vine that lives among other plants, poison oak and shumac are more bush-like. Learning what poison ivy looks like helps, the vine has smooth leaflets arranged in clusters of three. Which are red in early spring, change to shiny green in summer, and then back to red in autumn. Poison ivy sometimes has grey berries, too. If you know that you will be visiting a place where poison ivy grows. Wear pants and long sleeves and even gloves. Afterwards, your outfit should be washed as soon as possible separate from other clothes with hot water and strong soap. If you accidentally touch a poison ivy plant, wash your skin with soap and water right away and then use rubbing alcohol to make sure that all of its irritating oil is gone. If you get a rash anyway, try not to scratch, 
which will only make it worse. Most people get relief from such rashes with anti-itch medications like hydrocortisone, which reduces the swelling and keeps your body from reacting to the plant's oils. See a doctor if the rash covers your face or a large area on your body. If evergreens keep their needles all year long, why are there so many on the ground? A conifer doesn't keep each of its needle-like leaves forever. The needles usually have a three or four year lifespan, after which they are shed. A conifer is different from a deciduous tree in that it loses its leaves gradually. Rather than all at once. So a conifer always looks green. The same thick outer covering that keeps evergreen needles from. Losing water in their often dry environments also keeps them from decaying quickly once they are discarded. That is why you see so many dry needles on the ground under mature evergreens it takes a long time for these needles to decompose. Especially compared to the leaves that fall off deciduous trees. Do all flowers close at night? Many flowers close at night, or when the weather is cold. They start to shut as sunlight begins to fade. Studies have shown that the temperature inside a closed flower, where a plant's important reproductive structures and pollen are located, can be several degrees warmer than the surrounding air outside. In some flowers, the warmth attracts pollinating insects, who spend the night there. In the morning, when sunlight returns, flowers open again. Ready for insects and other animals to feed from them and spread their pollen. Some plants are even known to close their leaves at night. Some flowers remain closed during the day and open at night like the evening primrose. Such flowers follow that schedule because the creatures that feed from and pollinate them like moths and bats are nocturnal, or active only at night. Why are some plants poisonous? Plants can't run away from predators animals that will eat them so some have developed other methods of defense. Many plants have some poisonous parts. The leaves of a rhubarb plant are extremely dangerous to eat. For example, though its stems are quite harmless and tasty. Scientists believe that plants often have one poisonous part to keep predators away. While other parts remain harmless and safe for animal pollinators. Why do some whales make sounds underwater? with special instruments. People have been able to record the deep sounds that some whales make as they swim underwater. The mellow sounds are so lovely to listen to that they have 
been recorded on compact discs and tapes and sold in stores. Some whale sounds resemble barking and can be heard by humans. Whales also make clicking sounds that people can only hear with the help of special equipment. Scientists think that whales use these sounds to help them find their way and keep track of one another. Whales travel in groups, called pods, as they swim in the deep and often dark ocean. This technique is called echolocation. The vocalizations bounce off objects, creating echoes that return to the whale. Whales can see fairly well with their small eyes, but their hearing is extraordinary. Echolocation can tell the whale how big an object is, how far away it is, and in what direction it is traveling. Do killer whales attack humans? The killer whale, also known as orca, is a type of dolphin that can grow to be 31 feet. 9.5 meters, long and weigh 11,000 pounds, 5,000 kilograms. It eats fish, squid, and occasionally such sea mammals as seals and other dolphins. Despite its frightening name, the killer whale has never been known to attack a person. Killer whales are intelligent and, with their stark black and white coloring, dramatic looking animals. They learn quickly and can perform complex tasks. Abilities that have made them a favorite at aquariums and marine parks. Are all dolphins mammals? When we refer to dolphins, we usually mean the mammals that are in the same family with whales and porpoises. But there are some types of fish that are also referred to as dolphins one. That is known as mahi-mahi or dorado and another called pompano dolphin. These fish popular in sport fishing and as food do not resemble the mammalian dolphins. Why do evergreens have needles instead of leaves? The needles of conifers, or evergreens, are really specially shaped leaves. They have the same features that normal leaves have, tiny holes or stomata through which carbon dioxide and oxygen pass. The green substance chlorophyll that allows food making through photosynthesis. And special transportation cells that move food, water, and minerals to wherever they are needed. Conifer leaves are small, narrow, and have a thick surface, though, to limit transpiration, or water loss. Evergreens usually live in dry places where it is very cold for much of the year. Their special leaves allow them to live in the far north or high in the mountains. Where the ground is often frozen. These trees typical conical shape with narrow. Pointed tops and drooping branches also helps prevent damage during heavy snows. Conifers live in places with hot, dry summers, too.
like around the Mediterranean Sea in Europe and in the Middle East. Why is the lion known as the king of beasts? The lion is one of the largest members of the cat family. Found mostly in the open country of Central Africa. A male lion can reach up to 9 feet, 2.7 meters, long, including his tail. And weigh almost 400 pounds, 182 kilograms, the female is somewhat smaller. Powerfully built, lions can take down large. Swift running animals like zebra and antelope, on which they feed. Unique to the cat family, the male lion possesses a black or brown mane of long hair that grows on its neck, head, and shoulders. The mane can become quite enormous. The size and power of the male lion, his hunting habits, and his impressive mane have all likely contributed to his label as king of beasts. Lions also have commanding, thunderous roars, which can sometimes be heard more than a mile away. That, undoubtedly, have also contributed to their kingly reputation. Why do some flowers smell like perfume? Different chemicals in plants and flowers called essential oils give them their special scents. Flowers have fragrances so they can attract the creatures they need for cross-pollination. Some of the insects and other animals that feed from flowers have keen senses of smell. Bees, for instance, have sensitive odor detectors in their antennae, so most bee flowers are scented. Flowers that open only at night are often strongly scented. To help the creatures that feed from them like moths find them in the dark. Not all flowers have pretty scents, though. Some flowers actually smell like rotten meat or other decaying matter in order to attract flies. Flies usually lay their eggs in decaying materials because that's what hatched fly larvae. The immature stage of a fly, feed on, therefore. Flies are drawn to plants that look and smell, to the fly, anyway, like garbage. Bats that feed on plants are also attracted to flowers that have what we would consider unpleasant scents. Which tree is the tallest? Along the coast of Northern California and Southern Oregon, where the climate is cool and moist. Live some of the largest and most ancient trees in the world. They are sequoia trees, commonly known as redwoods because of the color of their bark and wood. There are two kinds of these conifers, which have scale-like leaves. The giant redwood, Sequoia sempervirens, is the tallest tree on earth. It can grow up to 385 feet, 117 meters, about as tall as a 37-story building. Its trunk can measure up to 25 feet, 7.6 meters, in diameter. 
many are more than 2,000 years old. The other giant sequoia, Sequoia dendron gigantum, isn't quite as tall, but it is wider and heavier. It can grow up to 325 feet, 99 meters, and have a trunk with a diameter up to 30 feet, 9.1 meters. With the biggest of these trees weighing an estimated 2,500 tons. They are considered the largest living things in the world, even bigger than blue whales. They have also been around longer than giant redwoods, with many almost 4,000 years old. Because the wood of sequoias is strong, beautiful, and decay resistant. Many of these rare and ancient trees have been cut down in past decades and used for building. Replacing such trees is difficult, as they can take up to 500 years to reach maturity. But now they are protected in some 30 national parks. If you go to the central west coast of the United States you can visit these special forests. You may even be able to drive your car through tunnels that have been carved out of the tree's huge trunks. Why do some trees lose their leaves in autumn? Broadleaf trees like maples and oaks are called deciduous trees because they lose their leaves in autumn. The loss of their leaves prepares these trees for the lack of water in winter. Cold, dry air has little moisture in it, and snow can supply water only when it melts. In addition, the frozen ground makes it difficult for a tree to draw up water through its roots. In spring and summer, gases pass and moisture escapes through thousands of microscopic openings. Or stomata, in the leaves. Without its leaves in the winter, a tree can conserve as much water as possible. In autumn, as the days get shorter and the nights get colder. Leaves are sealed off from the branches on which they grow, and water and minerals can no longer travel to them. Photosynthesis stops then, and the leaves gradually fall to the ground. The tree goes dormant, which is like going into a deep sleep, without its active food supply. It rests and stops growing, using food stored earlier to survive until spring arrives. How is a porpoise different from a dolphin? Both porpoises and dolphins are types of whales, they are closely related to one another. Porpoises are usually smaller, 4 to 6 feet, about 1 to 2 meters. Long while dolphins average about 8 feet, 2.4 meters, in length. The snout of a porpoise is more rounded, and its teeth are flatter. A dolphin has a long snout and cone-shaped teeth. Dolphins have long been studied for their intelligence, they are very fast learners. For the enormous variety of sounds that they make to communicate, whistles, clicks, and squeaks, and for the tender way that they care for one another and sometimes for human beings. There have been many reports of dolphins saving the lives of people who were drowning or divers who were lost. The most familiar dolphin species is the bottlenose dolphin. 
Most dolphins in aquariums are this type. Like many dolphins, this animal is graceful and very playful. Its snout gives the impression that the dolphin is smiling when its mouth is open. They can often be spotted on the open sea, following ships, and playfully leaping out of the water. Which plant grows the largest fruit? A plant known as the jackfruit, which grows in the countries of India and Sri Lanka, is thought to produce the largest fruits in the world. One fruit can weigh up to 50 pounds, 22 kilograms. They are oval, yellow, and prickly on the outside and have sweet or sour brown pulpy flesh on the inside. The flesh can be cooked or eaten raw. Which plant grows the largest fruit? A plant known as the jackfruit, which grows in the countries of India and Sri Lanka, is thought to produce the largest fruits in the world. One fruit can weigh up to 50 pounds, 22 kilograms. They are oval, yellow, and prickly on the outside and have sweet or sour brown pulpy flesh on the inside. The flesh can be cooked or eaten raw. Can flowers be eaten? Believe it not, people have been eating flowers for centuries. The broccoli and cauliflower that we eat are actually clusters of flowers. Artichokes are also flower heads. Even some blossoms that look more like regular flowers pansies and roses. For instance have a long edible history. Flowers can taste sweet, minty, or bitter. They give a special flavor or even a pretty look to many foods. But it is very important to know which flowers, or parts of flowers, can be eaten, because lots of plants are poisonous. Even if you know it isn't poisonous, it's better not to eat blooms that you find growing outside. Because you don't know if they've been treated with chemicals, pesticides, to control insects. Safe, edible flowers can be found in food stores. Or you can grow your own from seeds that come in specially. Labeled packets that tell you the flowers will be okay to eat. Can flowers be eaten? Believe it not, people have been eating flowers for centuries. The broccoli and cauliflower that we eat are actually clusters of flowers. Artichokes are also flower heads. Even some blossoms that look more like regular flowers pansies and roses. For instance have a long edible history. Flowers can taste sweet, minty, or bitter. They give a special flavor or even a pretty look to many foods. But it is very important to know which flowers, or parts of flowers. 
can be eaten, because lots of plants are poisonous. Even if you know it isn't poisonous, it's better not to eat blooms that you find growing outside. Because you don't know if they've been treated with chemicals, pesticides, to control insects. Safe, edible flowers can be found in food stores. Or you can grow your own from seeds that come in specially. Labeled packets that tell you the flowers will be okay to eat. How is fabric made from plants? Since ancient times, people have been using the fibers of plants to make cloth. Cotton, which comes from the cotton plant, and linen. Made from the flax plant, are the most important of these. The seeds of shrub-like cotton plants are surrounded by long, fluffy white fibers. The seeds and fibers are enclosed in capsules, or bowls. The bowls are picked either by hand or machine. And then the fibers are separated the from bowl and from the seeds. The fibers are then spun into yarn or thread strong enough to weave into cloth. Weaving is done on looms, which are frames or machines that interlace yarns or threads together. Different types of cotton plants produce fibers with different qualities. With some grown for their sturdiness and some for softness. For centuries, cotton has been grown in many parts of the world. And the cloth and objects made from it have provided valuable trade between countries. But because cotton grows best in mild climates with plenty of rain. The United States is now the biggest producer of cotton. To make linen, the stems of tall flax plants are soaked until they are partially decomposed. Their long fibers are then removed and used to make yarn or thread that is woven into fabric. Until the widespread use of cotton for clothing. Beginning around 1800, people generally wore linen clothes. Linen has been used for so long that examples of it have been found in Egyptian tombs more than 3,500 years old. Although linen is stronger and finer than cotton, it is harder to make because its fibers break easily. Linen is made in many parts of the world, with Ireland being its biggest producer. How is fabric made from plants? Since ancient times, people have been using the fibers of plants to make cloth. Cotton, which comes from the cotton plant, and linen. Made from the flax plant, are the most important of these. The seeds of shrub-like cotton plants are surrounded by long, fluffy white fibers. The seeds and fibers are enclosed in capsules, or bowls. The bowls are picked either by hand or machine. And then the fibers are separated the from bowl and from the seeds. The fibers are then spun into yarn or thread strong enough to weave into cloth. Weaving is done on looms, which are frames or machines that interlace yarns or threads together. 
Different types of cotton plants produce fibers with different qualities. With some grown for their sturdiness and some for softness. For centuries, cotton has been grown in many parts of the world. And the cloth and objects made from it have provided valuable trade between countries. But because cotton grows best in mild climates with plenty of rain. The United States is now the biggest producer of cotton. To make linen, the stems of tall flax plants are soaked until they are partially decomposed. Their long fibers are then removed and used to make yarn or thread that is woven into fabric. Until the widespread use of cotton for clothing. Beginning around 1800, people generally wore linen clothes. Linen has been used for so long that examples of it have been found in Egyptian tombs more than 3,500 years old. Although linen is stronger and finer than cotton, it is harder to make because its fibers break easily. Linen is made in many parts of the world, with Ireland being its biggest producer. How is medicine made from plants? Beginning in ancient times, people discovered through trial and error that certain plants could treat diseases, heal wounds, or stop pain. This valuable information was passed down from generation to generation. Today companies that make drugs either raise these special plants and extract their healing substances to put into medicines. Or study the plants and make chemical substitutes in laboratories. Currently, at least 25% of all the drugs that doctors prescribe still use extracts that come directly from plants. A substance called digitalin that is found in the leaves of the flowering foxglove plant. For instance, continues to help people with heart problems. And the dried sap of the seed pod of the opium poppy plant is still used as a powerful painkiller. New plants with healing properties continue to be discovered in unexplored places like the rainforests. But sadly large portions of these habitats have been and continue to be destroyed. How is medicine made from plants? Beginning in ancient times, people discovered through trial and error that certain plants could treat diseases, heal wounds, or stop pain. This valuable information was passed down from generation to generation. Today companies that make drugs either raise these special plants and extract their healing substances to put into medicines. Or study the plants and make chemical substitutes in laboratories. Currently, at least 25% of all the drugs that doctors prescribe still use extracts that come directly from plants. A substance called digitalin that is found in the leaves of the flowering foxglove plant. For instance, continues to help people with heart problems. And the dried sap of the seed pod of the opium poppy plant is still used as a powerful painkiller. New plants with healing properties continue to be discovered in unexplored places like the rainforests. 
but sadly large portions of these habitats have been and continue to be destroyed. How do airplanes fly? A large jet plane complete with hundreds of passengers weighs several hundred thousand pounds. How do airplanes fly? A large jet plane complete with hundreds of passengers weighs several hundred thousand pounds. How can this huge and heavy machine get off the ground in the first place? Let alone stay aloft for thousands of miles? Airplanes function according to a complex mix of aerodynamic principles theories that explain the motion of air and the actions of bodies moving through that air. Airplanes get their power from engines. Small planes generally use piston engines, which turn propellers that push aircraft through the air in the same way that boat propellers push vessels through water. But bigger planes use jet engines, powered by burning fuel. These engines expel great amounts of air that thrust them forward and up. Airplanes are able to lift into the air and stay there because of the shape of their wings. An airplane wing is flat on the bottom and curved on the top. When a plane's engines push it forward, air divides to travel around its wings. The air that passes over the larger curved top moves faster than the air that passes under the flat bottom. The faster moving air on top becomes thinner and has lower pressure than the air below which pushes the wing up. Uneven air pressure caused by the shape of an airplane's wings. Then, creates a force called lift, which allows an aircraft to fly. The force of moving air is also used to steer an airplane. Steering is done through a system of movable flaps working much like boat rudders that are located on the plane's wings and tail. When set at an angle, they push at flowing air that pushes back, turning or tilting an airplane. To descend, for instance, a pilot lowers a plane's tail flaps, causing airflow to direct its nose downward. Turning requires changing the direction of wing flaps and the tail rudder. An airplane must be in constant motion its wings slicing through rushing air to create lift in order to stay up. Moving air is also required to steer it. In other words, a plane cannot fly without the power of its engines thrusting it through the air. In order to get enough lift to rise into the air on takeoff. An airplane has to travel along the ground first at great speed. How can this huge and heavy machine get off the ground in the first place? Let alone stay aloft for thousands of miles? Airplanes function according to a complex mix of aerodynamic principles theories 
that explain the motion of air and the actions of bodies moving through that air. Airplanes get their power from engines. Small planes generally use piston engines, which turn propellers that push aircraft through the air in the same way that boat propellers push vessels through water. But bigger planes use jet engines, powered by burning fuel. These engines expel great amounts of air that thrust them forward and up. Airplanes are able to lift into the air and stay there because of the shape of their wings. An airplane wing is flat on the bottom and curved on the top. When a plane's engines push it forward, air divides to travel around its wings. The air that passes over the larger curved top moves faster than the air that passes under the flat bottom. The faster moving air on top becomes thinner and has lower pressure than the air below. Which pushes the wing up. Uneven air pressure caused by the shape of an airplane's wings. Then, creates a force called lift, which allows an aircraft to fly. The force of moving air is also used to steer an airplane. Steering is done through a system of movable flaps working much. Like boat rudders that are located on the plane's wings and tail. When set at an angle, they push at flowing air that pushes back, turning or tilting an airplane. To descend, for instance, a pilot lowers a plane's tail flaps. Causing airflow to direct its nose downward. Turning requires changing the direction of wing flaps and the tail rudder. An airplane must be in constant motion its wings slicing through rushing air to create lift in order to stay up. Moving air is also required to steer it. In other words, a plane cannot fly without the power of its engines thrusting it through the air. In order to get enough lift to rise into the air on takeoff. An airplane has to travel along the ground first at great speed. What is a sonic boom? As long as an aircraft is moving at a rate slower than the speed of sound, about 1,120 feet, or 340 meters, per second, which is known as Mach 1, the air that it disturbs is evenly distributed around it. But as an aircraft approaches Mach 1, the air molecules in front of it become crowded together. The impact made when an aircraft flies through them called breaking the sound. Barrier causes shockwaves that reach our ears as a thunderous sonic boom. The aircraft leaves the waves behind as it enters supersonic flight. A supersonic airplane is shaped quite differently than a regular, subsonic plane. It is usually shaped like a dart. With a long pointed nose and wings that swing back and hug the plane body. This slim shape causes less friction as it races through the air. The close set wings also stay within the shock waves the plane creates. Which is necessary to maintain control of the aircraft. While the special wings of supersonic planes don't provide as much lift as those of regular planes. The aircraft get the lift they need for takeoffs and landings by traveling at very high speeds.
What is a sonic boom? As long as an aircraft is moving at a rate slower than the speed of sound, about 1,120 feet or 340 meters per second, which is known as Mach 1, the air that it disturbs is evenly distributed around it. But as an aircraft approaches Mach 1, the air molecules in front of it become crowded together. The impact made when an aircraft flies through them called breaking the sound. Barrier causes shockwaves that reach our ears as a thunderous sonic boom. The aircraft leaves the waves behind as it enters supersonic flight. A supersonic airplane is shaped quite differently than a regular, subsonic plane. It is usually shaped like a dart. With a long pointed nose and wings that swing back and hug the plane body. This slim shape causes less friction as it races through the air. The close set wings also stay within the shock waves the plane creates. Which is necessary to maintain control of the aircraft. While the special wings of supersonic planes don't provide as much lift as those of regular planes. The aircraft get the lift they need for takeoffs and landings by traveling at very high speeds. How do air traffic controllers know where planes are in the sky? Air traffic controllers use radar invisible bands of energy called radio waves. Which are similar to visible light waves, to detect where airplanes are located in the air. They are the same type of waves as those used in broadcasting but with higher frequencies. Radar waves, which travel in a straight line and at a constant speed are sent out in all directions through antennae. When radar waves meet distant objects like planes, they are reflected back to receivers. Controllers can tell how far away the objects are located by the speed at which the reflected waves return. Radar receivers process the return signals electronically. Using them to visually plot planes on a screen that represents the sky. With radar, controllers can tell how high and fast a plane is flying and in what direction it is heading. While large commercial airplanes have their own radar devices on board to report their altitudes. Distance from the ground, and to warn them of obstacles in their paths, smaller aircraft do not. Air traffic controllers keep all planes around an airport at a safe distance from one another. And they direct takeoffs and landings. Controllers can even help a plane land in heavy fog by watching its flight on their radar screen and radioing directions to the pilot. Because radar can detect the position, motion, and even the size and shape of very distant objects, it is used for many other purposes. These purposes include ship navigation, storm detection and weather forecasting, map making, and space exploration. How do air traffic controllers know where planes are in the sky?
Air traffic controllers use radar invisible bands of energy called radio waves which are similar to visible light waves, to detect where airplanes are located in the air. They are the same type of waves as those used in broadcasting but with higher frequencies. Radar waves, which travel in a straight line and at a constant speed, are sent out in all directions through antennae. When radar waves meet distant objects like planes, they are reflected back to receivers. Controllers can tell how far away the objects are located by the speed at which the reflected waves return. Radar receivers process the return signals electronically. Using them to visually plot planes on a screen that represents the sky. With radar, controllers can tell how high and fast a plane is flying and in what direction it is heading. While large commercial airplanes have their own radar devices on board to report their altitudes, distance from the ground, and to warn them of obstacles in their paths, smaller aircraft do not. Air traffic controllers keep all planes around an airport at a safe distance from one another. And they direct takeoffs and landings. Controllers can even help a plane land in heavy fog by watching its flight on their radar screen and radioing directions to the pilot. Because radar can detect the position, motion, and even the size and shape of very distant objects, it is used for many other purposes. These purposes include ship navigation, storm detection and weather forecasting, map making, and space exploration. How do helicopters fly? Although a helicopter doesn't have wings like an airplane, it uses the same principle of lift to rise and maneuver in the air. The blades of a helicopter's propeller-like top rotor are shaped just like a plane's wings flat on the bottom and rounded on the top and are likewise adjustable. Instead of rushing forward through the air like a plane does to gather enough lift to fly. A helicopter moves only its, 3 to 6, rotor blades, which are attached to a central shaft driven by an engine. The rotor blades slice through enough air creating the changes. In surrounding air pressure that produce lift to achieve flight. Adjusting the angle at which the rotor blades are set helps control a helicopter's lift and manner of flight. Because the angle of the rotor is adjustable, too, a helicopter has far greater maneuverability than an airplane. Besides moving up, down, and forward, it can fly backwards and hover in the air. One problem with a helicopter's design is the spinning force of its main rotor. As the rotor blades of a helicopter turn, its shaft pushes back on the craft, trying to spin it in the opposite direction. The helicopter would spin out of control if it were not for an equal, counteracting force. This force is supplied by a second, smaller rotor located vertically on the craft's tail. Acting like a propeller, the thrust from this rotor pushes the tail in the direction opposite the twisting force of the main rotor. A helicopter pilot can adjust the thrust of this tail rotor in order to turn his or her craft. 
Some large helicopters that carry heavy loads have two top rotors, which supply twice as much lift. In such cases there is no need for a tail rotor because each horizontal rotor spins in an opposite direction. How do helicopters fly? Although a helicopter doesn't have wings like an airplane. It uses the same principle of lift to rise and maneuver in the air. The blades of a helicopter's propeller-like top rotor are shaped just like a plane's wings flat on the bottom and rounded on the top and are likewise adjustable. Instead of rushing forward through the air like a plane does to gather enough lift to fly. A helicopter moves only its, 3 to 6, rotor blades, which are attached to a central shaft driven by an engine. The rotor blades slice through enough air creating the changes. In surrounding air pressure that produce lift to achieve flight. Adjusting the angle at which the rotor blades are set. Helps control a helicopter's lift and manner of flight. Because the angle of the rotor is adjustable, too, a helicopter has far greater maneuverability than an airplane. Besides moving up, down, and forward, it can fly backwards and hover in the air. One problem with a helicopter's design is the spinning force of its main rotor. As the rotor blades of a helicopter turn, its shaft pushes back on the craft, trying to spin it in the opposite direction. The helicopter would spin out of control if it were not for an equal, counteracting force. This force is supplied by a second, smaller rotor located vertically on the craft's tail. Acting like a propeller, the thrust from this rotor pushes the tail in the direction opposite the twisting force of the main rotor. A helicopter pilot can adjust the thrust of this tail rotor in order to turn his or her craft. Some large helicopters that carry heavy loads have two top rotors, which supply twice as much lift. In such cases there is no need for a tail rotor because each horizontal rotor spins in an opposite direction. How do rockets blast off? A rocket has a simple heat engine. It uses quick burning fuels, known as propellants. In a combustion chamber, which has an open end at the bottom. The hot gases produced from the burning fuel expand and push in all directions. But they can escape only at the open end, and they do so with great speed and force. The difference in pressure between the closed front and open back of the chamber pushes the rocket forward. The size of a rocket blastoff depends on the amount of gas it produces and the speed at which it is released. Weapons like large missiles and spaceships use rocket engines to power them. The Chinese are believed to have used the first rocket type. Weapons pieces of bamboo filled with gunpowder about 1000 years ago. Most engines require oxygen, supplied by air, to burn the fuels that power them. 
Rocket engines, however, need to be able to operate in airless outer space. So they can't rely on oxygen normally found in the air. Rocket fuel is usually a mixture that includes oxygen in liquid form. How do rockets blast off? A rocket has a simple heat engine. It uses quick burning fuels, known as propellants. In a combustion chamber, which has an open end at the bottom. The hot gases produced from the burning fuel expand and push in all directions. But they can escape only at the open end, and they do so with great speed and force. The difference in pressure between the closed front and open back of the chamber pushes the rocket forward. The size of a rocket blastoff depends on the amount of gas it produces and the speed at which it is released. Weapons like large missiles and spaceships use rocket engines to power them. The Chinese are believed to have used the first rocket type. Weapons pieces of bamboo filled with gunpowder about 1000 years ago. Most engines require oxygen, supplied by air, to burn the fuels that power them. Rocket engines, however, need to be able to operate in airless outer space. So they can't rely on oxygen normally found in the air. Rocket fuel is usually a mixture that includes oxygen in liquid form. How do boats float? The weight of an object pulls it down into water. It displaces or pushes water aside. But if the object's density, its weight in relation to its size is less than the density of the water it displaces, it will float. That principle explains why a heavy wooden raft can float in water, while a small stone will sink to the bottom. One spreads its weight over a large area, while the other's weight is concentrated. Boats, which are hollow, float because of this principle. The air inside them makes them less dense than they appear. Large ships that transport heavy material, though, have less air inside when they are carrying a big load. Such ships must be careful about weight limits and have load lines on there. Hulls that show how low they can ride in the water and still maneuver safely. Weight limits vary with the kind of water the boats are traveling through, they can carry more weight when in salt water seas. Which are denser than fresh water, and in cold water, which is denser than warm water. Boats need a power source to move them forward in the water. In small vessels this power can be provided by people, who use oars to paddle along. Muscle power can't move boats very fast or very far, though. The wind can be used, too, as long as it's blowing, to move boats equipped with sails. But for a large boat that needs to go a long distance. The most reliable source of power is a motor-driven engine. Depending on the size of the boat, a gasoline engine, diesel engine, or steam engine can do the job. 
nuclear power is even used to run some boat engines, like those found in submarines. Motors rotate boat propellers, which have large twisting blades that radiate around a central hub. These blades push water backwards, and the boat moves forward as the disturbed water pushes back. Rotating propellers also create lower water pressure in the space in front of them, which sucks them forward, along with the vessel to which they are attached. Using these same principles of movement, propellers can also power aircraft. A boat is steered by a rudder, which is a flat, upright, movable piece of wood or metal that is attached to its stern, or rear. When turned, the rudder changes the direction of the water around it which pushes back forcing the stern. And gradually the rest of the boat, to change direction, too. Because boats must push aside the weight of the water through which their hulls are moving. They do not travel very fast. Water that is pushed one way always pushes back, causing resistance. Boats that are meant to go fast, like speed boats, are designed to ride as high in the water as possible, to minimize water drag. Their hulls are shaped to rise out of the water when they are running at top speeds. How do boats float? The weight of an object pulls it down into water. It displaces or pushes water aside. But if the object's density, its weight in relation to its size, is less than the density of the water it displaces, it will float. That principle explains why a heavy wooden raft can float in water, while a small stone will sink to the bottom. One spreads its weight over a large area, while the other's weight is concentrated. Boats, which are hollow, float because of this principle. The air inside them makes them less dense than they appear. Large ships that transport heavy material, though, have less air inside when they are carrying a big load. Such ships must be careful about weight limits and have load lines on there. Hulls that show how low they can ride in the water and still maneuver safely. Weight limits vary with the kind of water the boats are traveling through, they can carry more weight when in salt water seas. Which are denser than fresh water, and in cold water, which is denser than warm water. Boats need a power source to move them forward in the water. In small vessels this power can be provided by people, who use oars to paddle along. Muscle power can't move boats very fast or very far, though. The wind can be used, too, as long as it's blowing, to move boats equipped with sails. But for a large boat that needs to go a long distance. The most reliable source of power is a motor-driven engine. Depending on the size of the boat, a gasoline engine, diesel engine, or steam engine can do the job. Nuclear power is even used to run some boat engines, like those found in submarines. Motors rotate boat propellers, which have large twisting blades that radiate around a central hub. These blades push water backwards, and the boat moves forward as the disturbed water pushes back. 
rotating propellers also create lower water pressure in the space in front of them, which sucks them forward, along with the vessel to which they are attached. Using these same principles of movement, propellers can also power aircraft. A boat is steered by a rudder, which is a flat, upright, movable piece of wood or metal that is attached to its stern, or rear. When turned, the rudder changes the direction of the water around it which pushes back forcing the stern. And gradually the rest of the boat, to change direction, too. Because boats must push aside the weight of the water through which their hulls are moving. They do not travel very fast. Water that is pushed one way always pushes back, causing resistance. Boats that are meant to go fast, like speed boats, are designed to ride as high in the water as possible, to minimize water drag. Their hulls are shaped to rise out of the water when they are running at top speeds. How do submarines sink and rise? The body of a submarine is uniquely constructed. Under its strong outer hull are huge ballast tanks that surround its working core. The tanks can be filled with and emptied of seawater and air. Which allows the submarine to sink or rise in the water. When a submarine travels on the surface, its ballast tanks are filled with air. Which makes it less dense than the seawater it displaces, and it floats. But when a submarine needs to submerge or dive below the surface, its ballast tanks are flooded with seawater. This action makes the submarine sink. Now equal in density to the water that surrounds it, it can move about below the surface. Motor-driven propellers are used to move the vessel along, its streamlined shape creating as little water resistance as possible. And swiveling fins located on its sides, called hydroplanes, direct it up and down. When a submarine needs to return to the surface, compressed air stored in tanks is blown into the ballast tanks. This air forces out the seawater, and the vessel begins to rise, aided by the hydroplanes. Once again lighter than the seawater it displaces, the submarine is able to float on the surface. How do submarines sink and rise? The body of a submarine is uniquely constructed. Under its strong outer hull are huge ballast tanks that surround its working core. The tanks can be filled with and emptied of seawater and air. Which allows the submarine to sink or rise in the water. When a submarine travels on the surface, its ballast tanks are filled with air which makes it less dense than the seawater it displaces, and it floats. But when a submarine needs to submerge or dive below the surface, its ballast tanks are flooded with seawater. This action makes the submarine sink. Now equal in density to the water that surrounds it, it can move about below the surface. 
Motor-driven propellers are used to move the vessel along, its streamlined shape creating as little water resistance as possible. And swiveling fins located on its sides, called hydroplanes, directed up and down. When a submarine needs to return to the surface. Compressed air stored in tanks is blown into the ballast tanks. This air forces out the seawater, and the vessel begins to rise, aided by the hydroplanes. Once again lighter than the seawater it displaces, the submarine is able to float on the surface. 